Turn in, <clears throat> turn in the Word of God this morning, beloved, to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. We are in the heart of this epistle, and in some ways because of the, the flow of argument, it can be difficult to dip in and dip out and, and fully grasp all that's going on, but I do commend to you this epistle to become familiar with it. In some ways you might say, well, is it not written to Jews, those who are of the physical seed of Abraham? Therefore, why would I need to study a book that is addressed to, to people like that when I'm, I'm not in that category? And yet, the encouragement of this book applies to every one of us in that it doesn't matter, even though these Hebrews had their own peculiar temptation to move away from Jesus Christ, it's not peculiar to them. The temptation to move away from Christ, to try and find satisfaction in someone or something else is a temptation that we all face. And whether or not we are feeling it in terms of just a carnal moving away, going into the world, living for ourselves, whether we find another religion that seems to address our peculiar concerns or our felt needs a little more, or, or whatever it might be. The, the temptation to abandon Jesus Christ is very, very real. We were dealing with this, and you see the themes coming together uh, in our Sunday evening messages as we have looked at our Lord's address at the time of the institution of the Lord's table and some of the things we learn there, both from Judas, who goes away, and then from the disciples who continue with him through his tribulations, and of course, Peter and the rest of them who are taught very profoundly of their need to keep looking on to Christ, otherwise they will fall away. So the overall subject, though it's not addressed to Gentiles, as most if not all of us are, yet the encouragement to keep our eyes fixed on Christ is relevant to us all. We're going to read from verse 1 again. Try to just familiarize yourself with the language, the focus of our attention Today will be verses 15, 16, and 17. But we're in the heart of the argument. The language is not the easiest that you will find in the Bible. But I hope that we will profit from our study here today. Hebrews 9 verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and... A worldly sanctuary. There was a tabernacle made. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as at the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. 
For if the blood of bulls and of goats, the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Now by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of inter- eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with with blood of others, For them must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. This is... The living word of God, may you receive it as the very word of God to your souls and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, help us. Help us to rightly receive the engrafted word that is able to save our souls. This is not a trifling matter. Our Lord Jesus instructed us, take heed how ye hear. So there may be an aspect in which we can bestir our physical frame and try to sit up and pay attention as best as we know how. But there's another degree in which we must be taught of God. So I pray that both in ourselves we would rightly prepare our hearts to receive the word, that we would pay attention to what you have given, but at the same time, you would come and aid us. We pray the Spirit then would be our teacher. Do come and comfort and console to guide, instruct and help to sanctify us through thy truth and extend thy kingdom through the heralding of thy word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, and maybe I should address the boys and girls especially, This morning, boys and girls, we are going to learn more about what we refer to as Jesus Christ as a mediator, a mediator. Now, this is a term perhaps that you have come across before. You've heard of Jesus being a mediator. Maybe even you've memorized a text that tells us that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. What does it mean for Jesus Christ to be the mediator? What does it mean for us when we read in verse 15, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament? Now, when we think about a mediator, just in practical terms, we're talking about someone who is a go-between, who exists to bring together two or more parties. He stands between them and he's trying to reconcile or in some way communicate between the multiple parties involved. In this case, it is the Son of God acting as a mediator and functioning in that role between God and men. And this he has been appointed to do from eternity. It didn't happen at the incarnation. 
It didn't happen at his baptism. It didn't happen at the cross and the resurrection and ascension. He has been appointed to be mediator from what we sometimes refer to all eternity. That's always been the case. Appointed to be the mediator between God and men. Now, when you start thinking about eternity and the fact that something has always been, you begin to reach the limitations of your own mind. And that's true for all of us. It doesn't matter who we are here this morning. We know from the scriptures that this is true. I'll just give one scripture that we have in Ephesians 1, verse 4, which tells us that we are chosen, believers are chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world. They are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That implies that there is someone representing this us, we who are the people of God. Someone's representing. And this one, of course, is Jesus Christ. That's what the text tells us. And he stands in this role as mediator. And all that he does is functioning in that role. Everything that Jesus Christ did, is doing, and will do is functioning in this role because he is appointed eternally to be the mediator of the people of God. And so the Son of God from all eternity has been in his threefold office, prophet, priest, and king. I don't want to explore that, but you can have just in a, in a short way, you can see why is it that God communicates to man? Because there's a mediator appointed to be a prophet and reveal the mind of God. That's why. Now you can go back further and you talk about, you know, God is and God has spoken and so on. <clears throat> but it is, is seen through, it is seen through this fact that the Son of God is appointed to be a mediator and part of his role is as prophet to communicate the mind of God. The priest is him functioning in that mediatorial role in terms of representing and sacrificing and king ruling and reigning over his and our enemies. It was the Son of God communicating to Adam in the Garden of Eden. It was the Son of God communicating to Noah regarding the dimensions of the ark and everything that goes along with it. It was the Son of God who met with Abraham on several occasions. The same is true for Isaac, for Jacob, for Moses, and for others that meet with God in the Old Testament Scriptures. It is the Son of God acting as mediator, relaying the mind of God, and communicating what is necessary on those given occasions. But the time came when the mediator must fulfill that which was foundational in his role, that which was necessary, given that one of the parties had wronged the other party. The people had sinned against God, broken his law, and in order to reconcile, and we have it, it's just interesting to me that the very text of our focus in terms of, sal of, our, of our forgiveness in the, the reading this morning was Galatians 4, where it tells us that when the fullness of the time has come, because I had this, this verse in here, my sermon, as I was going over it this morning, I put in Galatians 4, just add in Galatians 4, because that's, that's the heart of it. When the fullness of the time was come, when the time came that God had appointed, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's the mediator fulfilling his role. That's the mediator taking on our humanity. We have learned from this book in Hebrews that in order for us to have a priest who functions rightly for us before God, he must have our nature. And that's what he does. He comes, boys and girls, in that time when he came to Bethlehem and he was born of a virgin and entered into this world, that's him fulfilling this role as a mediator for sinners. <clears throat> He comes then to stand between God and men, living for us, dying for us, rising from the dead for us, that he might bring our humanity into the presence of God, represent us there. And as we know, it is his intention not to leave us even now as we are, but as he prays in John 17, 24, Father, I will that those whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory. The mediator wants those he represents to be near to him, which is what is going to happen for us all. We will be brought right into the presence of our mediator because that's his will. He has represented us and he wants us to be with him where he 
is. The book of Hebrews so shows us the sufficiency and superiority of Jesus, the Son of God, as a mediator of the people of God. And before we get to the meat of our text, which you see from verse 15, begins with this whole subject. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament or the New Covenant. It raises, it raises this question over one of the most important words in your New Testament. And that is the Greek word that you find translated, at least in your authorized version, translated either as testament or covenant. I have to deal with this before I get to the meat of the text because it's key when it comes to this passage. Sometimes the translation doesn't make a big, huge difference. And so you find it translated maybe as testament or you translate it as covenant. And in some ways you can see a certain synonymous aspect to the word. There, there are things in which they overlap, but they're also distinct. And the verses we are looking at this morning are one of those passages where getting the right word is really important. And so I, I need you to hear me because if you switch off now, it's not going to make any sense because at the end, when I come to verses 16 and 17 and I give to you how I read that text, if you're, if you're switched off now, you're not going to understand why is he reading the verse that way? It's going to be really important when we come to that. As I read over this in preparation, and the Greek word, of course, is diatheke, 33 times in your New Testament you find the word, 20 times it's translated covenant, 13 times it's translated as testament, 14 of the 33 times it's in the book of Hebrews. So over half of it is found in this book. So understanding what the author of Hebrews, what the apostle is saying here is key. And when I read over it, as I say, I'm asking myself, what is the right word? As you read it, look over it again. You'll see an emphasis on the word testament. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That's the word, deatheke. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, this comes to the whole concept, the legal concept of, of what we sometimes refer to as last will and testament. It is when there, there's a certain contract given that when one dies, it's going to be, the will is going to be executed. The testament is going to be executed in a particular way. And when theologians come to this passage, especially in light of the, the language of, of dealing with inheritance, which you have at the end of verse 15, the promise of eternal inheritance, when we think of inheritance, we think again of last will and testament, right? And especially when you read verses 16 and 17, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, right? In order to bring to pass the execution of the testament, the last will and testament, there is death. This is how we normally think of things. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. It doesn't come into effect. You don't get your inheritance until he dies. So the reason then that translators, and I would say from my own study, the vast majority of those who are exegeting this passage understand this in the language of a legal concept of a last will and testament is because that's how they try to wrestle with this language. However, <laughs> I had a problem with that. I'm just... I had about a thousand words written trying to explain this. I'm going to spare you all of that because when I was done, I thought this is going to be even more boring if I try to explain all of this to you. But follow me. I hope it will be enlightening. I'm reading verse 18. I'm not preaching verse 18, but you have to read ahead, right? And I'm reading verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So there is added in there the word testament right, for context, and rightly so. That's the sense of it. There's a continuity here. And the continuity of verse 18 is such that you have, you have a premise and a conclusion. The conclusion of verse 18, he's coming to, whereupon, right, because of what's stated, I'm going to draw this conclusion. When 
When you get to verse 18 and following, it's clear that in the mind of the apostle, he is looking to Sinai and the establishment of the covenant there at Sinai. And how Moses took animals, took blood, and ratified the covenant that brought into being the old covenant made with the children of Israel, right? Which, which resulted in the Levitical priesthood and the tabernacle and the sacrifices and all the things that we've already looked at. That's in view, clearly as you follow. We would never read what Moses did and what happened in Exodus 19 and Exodus 24, and that passage, that section, we would never read it as being a last will and testament. And you don't have blood shed for a last will and testament. You don't, you don't take animals in order to execute a will. You don't sacrifice animals. So I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm asking, it's like, is, are, we, are we right in this? Are we right in making this a last will and testament? Or should we maintain what the author normally has in mind, at least previous to this, is the idea of covenant. A covenant that is ratified by the shedding of blood. What's in view? So you start trying to make sense of it. And the language isn't making sense to me, how it's traditionally taken. I then read one commentator who brings another problem that I raise another issue when he notes in verses 16 and 17. He says, what our author says in verses 16 and 17 does not correspond to any known form of Hellenistic or indeed any other legal practice. A Hellenistic was secure, a Hellenistic will rather, was secure and valid when it was written down, witnessed and deposited, not when the testator died. Further, the distribution of the estate could occur when the testator was still living. So that's history. And if the scholar's right, then again, it's not fitting even in the context how it's being understood. Now we can read it and how we understand last will and testament and read into that. And that's what the translators have done and that's what the large majority of expositors have done in trying to understand this. But I'm trying to be honest with the language of the the apostle and his use of this word that in every other context we would almost say covenant would be the more accurate word. I'm trying to bring that together and finding myself for the most, for the most part with this wind of opposition saying you've gotten it wrong. But I, it, there, there are problems on both sides. I'll spare you all the issues. But in summary, this is where I've landed. I believe we should, if we can, in Hebrews, maintain the apostles' use of Diatheke to refer to the old covenant made at Sinai or the new covenant ratified by the death of Jesus Christ. This brings challenges, and we'll see that as we move through here, but I think the challenges on the other side are even more significant, at least as I understand it. So that is my summary of what was almost going to take up half my sermon as my summary of it. And now we're going to proceed into verses 15 through 17 and most of our time will be spent on verse 15. The mediator of the new covenant. I've given it that language because that's what I think is the right way to understand it. For this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. First, Christ is the mediator, right? Making that clear that the one referred to here in verse 15 is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see two things here. First of all, his suitability. For this cause and for this cause... You see the flow of argument? The flow of argument is showing to us two things. One is backwards and one is forwards. Backwards, you go back to chapter 8, verse 6. Look at it. The flow of the argument. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So we have this idea already there, verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So he's been establishing this. There had to be because of a shortcoming in the old covenant. It didn't address the problem of sin. That has been established now in the chapter 9. We've seen this, the shortcoming that the blood of the animals couldn't deal with sin. Therefore, there's need for the Lord Jesus Christ and his sufficiency. And so we have noted that Though God had appointed the Levitical sacrifices and the Levitical priesthood, they could never deal with the real issue. 
And so what we have in the new covenant is one mediated by the God-man, Jesus Christ. Verse 11 of chapter 9, we see that he officiates in a superior tabernacle. Okay? We're not dealing with this tabernacle made with hands. It's one not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building or this creation. Okay? He's dealing in a superior place in terms of where he officiates. He offers a superior sacrifice, doesn't he? Because he offers himself. Verse 14, he offered himself without spot to God, and he obtained a superior redemption. It is eternal redemption, verse 12. So these are just highlights of what we've already considered, these three things. The suitability of Christ, in contrast to all that the, 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 the Jews were holding on to, they're holding on to their practices, their, their priesthood, the, the, the sacrifices and all the ceremonies that go along with it. And they're trying to find some value and merit in it. And it's not without merit. It had a certain merit. It kept them ceremonially able to engage in worship with God. And it had a purpose. And we've dealt with that, so I won't repeat it. But it couldn't deal with the root issue. Man has fallen. He is in sin. He's come short of the glory of God. And he has no power in himself to redeem, to save, to procure salvation in and of himself. He cannot do what is necessary to reconcile. He needs a mediator. And this is where the argument has come to. That in Christ, again officiating a superior tabernacle, offering a superior sacrifice, obtaining a superior redemption, now obviously fits this place where he can truly be seen as the mediator of the new covenant. This is part of the cause. He is suitable. The new covenant, you see, promised to do an internal work, right? If you go to the end of chapter 8, and you look from verse 10 and following, I'll not read it all, but just to remind you, this is language from Jeremiah 31. The prophet, through the prophet, God is saying, there's coming a new covenant, and it, it doesn't deal merely with exterior. It must deal with the inner part of man. So if I could summarize the language of verse 10 and following in terms of the new covenant, in terms of its, the internal aspect of what it was doing, it gives a knowledge of God's precepts, right? Verse 10, a knowledge of God's person, they will know me, and a knowledge of God's pardon, right? The forgiveness of sins. Precepts, his person, and his pardon. That's a summary of the new covenant that deals with the inner man. It deals with the inner man. You can come and you can engage in all those ceremonies and not have this. You can practice everything and give your life and soul to all of it. You can even be a priest engaged in it every day like the sons of Eli. And yet you don't have an internal work in you. And what this is guaranteeing is there's this day where we'll see the full substance of all that God has promised when his son comes and he mediates then a covenant that without any, any kind of ambiguity is dealing with the inner part of man, addressing his real need. So he is then this mediator he realizes all that is promised in the new covenant. Christ is the only way this can happen. How is it that the law would be truly in their hearts? How is it that they should truly know God? How is it that their sins and iniquities will he remember no more? It's all coming to fruition through this mediator. Not Moses, not Aaron, but Jesus Christ. He is the only one suitable. And so if you remember back in chapter 7, verse 22... It said there, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament or better covenant. He is a surety of it. He is the one who must fully satisfy the demands. He must bring sinners to God who are under its, the full penalty of the law. He must deal with all the debt, as it were, and bring them to God. He's the only one suitable. So, Jesus Christ is the mediator. He is the only one suitable. Let me ask you before we move on. Can you find another one suitable? If you're new here and you're like maybe part of what we've been dealing with this morning has gone over your head because there's no foundation there. 
Let me ask you simply this. Are you aware of any alternative that will deal with the problem of your sin in reality and give you confidence that on the day of judgment you can stand before God knowing that all your sin has been dealt with in full? Can you find an alternative? The argument, the apostle, is no. There is no alternative. And it was never to be that what Moses instituted, what the Levitical priesthood did, what the sacrifices and all their performance were about, none of that was meant to take away from what Jesus Christ alone could fulfill. And that has been part of what we've seen through this epistle. So with suitability for this cause, for this cause, we see it in what we have already considered together. But you see also what it promises to us, and we'll look at it in just a moment. That they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. It can't bring that to pass. Only Christ can do that. Also his sacrifice. Not only his suitability, but his sacrifice. For this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant, that by means of death, that by means of death, This brings into view. How, how, do I, how do I get this across to you? Because we read language like this, right? We read this text a few minutes ago together. And no one was stunned or amazed at this language, right? We just took it for granted by means of death. That the mediator of the new covenant in order to bring about the blessings of that covenant must die. Now if you're reading that about a family member, if you read something in the paper that said something or even you tried to portray it about your own family that in order to give a certain blessing to your child, you have to die. That the only way to confer it is by death. You would ponder the predicament of that. You'd be horrified at what it would be like to make a choice like that. That the only way this child can be saved, can be delivered from, from a debt, from some other awful circumstance, whatever it might be, that the only way it can be accomplished is by the death of the father. Your heart would bleed to be in that predicament. And yet, we've read it here today, and it's washed over us as if it's nothing. Beloved, let not the familiarity with what is involved in the personal work of Jesus Christ make us so numb to what this is communicating. The mediator who brings us near to God, the one who's fulfilled everything necessary so that I need not fear the consequences of my sin. I need not worry about whether or not I will see the inside of God's hell. All of those concerns are gone. We're living here free, happy, rejoicing. We literally could not ask for greater blessings than what we already possess in Christ and it necessitated by means of death. I say this because in my study, I'm going over this, it was almost like I was myself passing over that little clause by means of death. And then I was thinking, well, I've dealt with this so much through this book. Why deal with it again? But it's put in there. Put in there, and we're meant to pause over it, contemplate that the, the mediator who brings us near to God had to die to realize it by means of death. How is it then that we can sin so easily? How is it that we are so self centered? Because we are, aren't we? Far too often. 
My mind was drawn then to Isaac Watts' language. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. I don't know if it's true said that Charles Wesley, who wrote thousands of poems, thousands of hymns, said he would gladly set aside them all if he could take ownership of this language and say, I wrote that. We don't survey. You have to survey the cross and you have to see the wonder of it. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory, the Prince of Glory died. He died. What's new, the only response to that is a full surrender. An abandoning of oneself to Christ. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. All the vain things that charm me most. What is it for you? I don't know what it was for Isaac Watts. But there are things that charm us. That charm you, charm me. Charm us in such a way that our attention is diverted from the cross to whatever it is. Some of those things are in competition and need to be put to death. Okay, so the Christ is the mediator. Secondly, the mediator's death must put away sin. The mediator's death must put away sin. Verse 15, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So as we think of the mediator's death and the fact that it must put away sin, first thing is, this is necessary for past, present, and future believers. It is necessary for past, present and future believers. The wording of this is interesting. For the redemption of the transgressions, for the, but by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, not for the redemption of the transgressors, although certainly that's true, but that's not what the apostle writes, for the redemption of the transgressions. In other words, his, his focus then in terms of, of Christ's death is dealing with sin, the problem of sin. It's not vaguely buying man. It's not just he's, he's there dying for men, but it's a particular problem in man that results or required this death. The redemption of the transgressions. He's, he's paying a debt. The wages of sin, Romans 6, is death. There's a debt. Your sin, every day your sin mounts up as a debt before God. Every single day. Every commandment is broken by you in thought, in word, and in deed. You're constantly guilty, constantly. It's not something that happens every once in a while. It's not something that occasionally comes by and you're caught off guard and maybe you succumb to some temptation every so often, every blue moon or so to speak. This is something that is in us, constantly in us, revealed by us. And those who know us best see it. Those who know us best are well aware and then if we have any sense of ourselves and any monitoring of our own hearts and our own lives, we'll be even more con conscious of the fact that this is what we are, sinners. And Christ's death on the cross is to deal with the transgressions, the transgressions, the breaking of that law from top to bottom, every aspect, in areas you don't even comprehend, sins you're not even sure you're guilty of. 
thoughts that come into your mind and out again that break the law of God that you've forgotten even entered your mind. All of that is paying for in full. The number is unquantifiable. You, you can't begin to fathom our sins and Christ takes ownership of them all. That by death, for the redemption of the transgressions. But look what it says. That we're under the first testament or the first covenant or the old covenant because the context here is dealing with that which was arranged at Sinai. The apostle is focusing on the, the particular shortcomings of believers in the past, Old Testament saints, those who lived before the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And this is a common question, actually. You have people often ask this. I had a man I used to witness to in my place of employment many years ago, and he one day he was, I didn't have a vehicle, and he needed to take me home. And on the way home, I'm trying to witness to him, share the gospel with him, and he, 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 he knew it. He was familiar with it. But he asked me a question. What about those before Jesus lived and died and rose again? And that's what the apostle is dealing with here. Those who sinned in the past. What about them? Obviously, it was of concern to those the apostle is addressing because, again, he's, he's fighting this, this, he's arguing from every angle in which he is facing a, a problem in which, well, maybe, 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 it's, maybe it's Jesus plus the ceremonies or maybe we need to go back to the ceremonies or whatever the temptation is. And part of the argument might be, well, well, we should continue what our fathers did because we have to believe that what they did put them in right favor with God. Or if they don't, if we believe what you're saying, Paul, does that mean that they're not saved? I mean, you can see the different questions that may have arisen. What the apostle then argues is that Christ as the mediator of the new covenant was the foundation of everyone's hope in every single age, doesn't matter who you are. The redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. And so as A.W. Pink notes, the efficacy of Christ's atonement was retrospective as well as prospective. It dealt with the past, it dealt with the future. Equally, equally. And so th this is why we say to you, beloved, that when you read your Old Testament scriptures, look for Jesus Christ. He doesn't just appear every now and again. It's not an occasional appearance. You should be looking for him everywhere. And I would far rather, I know that sometimes this gets criticized among those who look for Christ in the Old Testament, and some people like to smirk and say, well, I, I heard this sermon preaching that Christ was here. I don't believe that's dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ at all. You know, and there's arguments, there's, is Joseph really a type of Christ? And so on and so forth. I mean, you have all these kind of arguments. But give me the man who sees Jesus where he isn't than the man who fails to see Jesus where he is. Because our eyes ought to be looking for him. If Jesus Christ opened the scriptures in Luke 24 and opened onto them and taught the things concerning himself in the Old Testament scriptures, then our own eyes have to be looking for the same subject matter. We're looking for Christ. Where is he? So you see not just the, the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. The voice of the Lord. What is that? What is the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day? It's the Son of God. Your eyes are to see him. Because he is, as I say, the mediator. In eternity. Appointed the mediator. In eternity. So all the angles of redemption. Every way in which it's being pointed to and men are being directed towards is terminating in the person and work of Jesus Christ without exception last week we referred as we were considering the blood of Christ in verse 14 we referred to 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19 talking about not being redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold but the the precious blood. And what follows in verse 20 says, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, 
And so you see how Peter is pulling in the same thing, that Christ was foreordained. He's pulling together the, the sacrifice of Christ, that our salvation is through the blood, this, this impeccable person, the God-man Jesus Christ, dying for sinners, and it was foreordained before the foundation of the world and is manifest in these last times. It's here, it's happened, but it was always planned. So the Old Testament saints always needed to see the substance of what it was they were being taught. So when Adam, and I've mentioned this to you before, but I go back to familiar things so it beds in, right? When Adam has sinned and God comes to him, and God is addressing his problem, and he gives him the promise, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. And then he, of course, has sought by his own effort to sew together fig leaves to cover himself in a shame. God takes on hand then to do a proper work of it, as it were, in order to show Adam what he needed. And it, an animal is killed, and he is clothed with the skin of an animal. Now, it's just there. It's a tiny little mention of it. And you say, well, is, what's going on there? And I tell you, God is preaching the gospel to Adam. God is preaching the gospel to Adam. Let me be more specific. The Son of God is preaching the gospel to Adam. And Adam believes it. He believes it. The reason I know he believes it is because he turns around and looks uh, the gift of his wife given to him by God and calls her Eve, the mother of life, the mother of living. He is no longer feeling this weight of death, which was what God said, the day you eat thereof you will die. And he sees in the glory of the message communicated to him a hope of life and calls his wife Eve. He's believing God for it. And that is what you have then through the Old Testament. Men were God, read Galatians 3. Galatians 3 it tells us specifically that God preached the gospel to Abraham. The good news. We have seen it in this book of the Israelites being brought out of Egypt. And what does it tell us about them? In Hebrews 4.2, that the gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us. The same message. This is my point, beloved. It's the same unifying theme of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. It unifies the entire Bible. It gives the only hope that there is for men. And so the Old Testament saints needed to recognize this, that all that they were doing in terms of sacrifices only typified, they didn't realize their forgiveness that they needed Christ to do. Now go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. So you can see this. In fact, I'm just, I'm just realizing... I've looked at my notes the wrong way. Forget Hebrews 11. We'll get back there in just a minute. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm skipping. I'm reading the last chapter when I should be. I'm still in the middle of the book, right? Let's not do that. I was thinking to myself, this isn't right. This, is, <laughs> this isn't fitting. Christ is what they're looking for. Go to Acts 15. I want you to turn there for a moment. Just to see a text at the Jerusalem Council. So you can see how the great delight of the first century church was in seeing the continuity of God's mercy in every generation. Acts 15. And they've, of course, they're discussing about the matter of circumcision and everything that goes along with it. And it really it's an argument about how you're justified, right? You see it from verse 1. Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved, right? This isn't a trifling issue. This is about how a man is right before God. Of course, they discuss it. Come to verse 10. God, when the account has been given here, given here by Peter, 
about God putting no difference between us and the Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Verse 9, verse 10. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Even as they. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved. Even as they. And the point is there's this unifying message. It doesn't matter. In any age, it's the same hope that we have. We're not looking to different forms of salvation. It's only through Jesus Christ. So, the old covenant could not deal with the problem of sin. We've seen that in past weeks. It was never intended to. And Christ's work was always meant to be the ground of the believer's hope in every age. And so this is why, it doesn't matter, past, present, future, we point to Jesus Christ. So, the mediator's death must put away sin. Necessary for past, present, and future believers. Secondly, it's necessary to obtain our eternal inheritance. Go back to Hebrews 9. Because this is where you get to the heart. What is this all leading to? They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance is the goal. This is the termination in terms of what is, what is it we're looking for from God? Eternal inheritance. And the Old Testament saints were looking for this. They were looking for eternal inheritance. Now, when you read this text, I want you to see something wonderful because really verse 15 is the Exodus in a nutshell, right? What happened in the Exodus? People were in bondage and they were delivered, brought out of that deliverance and set free through God's mercy, interacting, intervening for them. And then they were promised a land and they're heading towards that land. That was their inheritance. So you have dealing with the problem of sin and the inheritance of the land. Look at verse 15 in light of that again. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, think of the Passover, think of Christ, our Passover lamb, think of the animal dying there on that night when they were delivered. By means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, right, dealing with the problem of sin, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. They were led out of Egypt with the hope of going into the promised land, right? You have verse 15 functioning as a little window into the Exodus itself, mirroring what happened there. And this is a vital point because what they were looking for, what they were meant to be looking for, was an eternal inheritance, not just Canaan. Now this is missed. Now I go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. But in the unifying of our faith, Jew and Gentile, Old Testament and New, we realize that Christ is the only way of salvation. He is the mediator, right? For us all. But sometimes people get it into their mind that there are certain things promised to some people, not to the rest of us. What I want you to see is while the Jew, while Abraham and his offspring were promised certain things in a time, it's, it was functioned similarly to the ceremonies and the sacrifices. And it was pointing to something. It wasn't the substance itself. So those animals died. Is that the substance? Is that their hope of salvation? Is it, is it through that that they get salvation? Is their mediator found in Aaron or the following high priest? No, it was never meant to. They were meant to see through that and land on Jesus Christ. And it's the same with everything. So that when you look at Jesus Christ and all that is promised to us, it is leading the same way for us all. So Hebrews 11, looking at verse 13. Now, if you, you know this chapter, by faith, by faith, by faith, we have these different characters from Abel onwards that are dealt with. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Right? So there were some of these ones that were given promises that never saw it come like Abraham. Abraham never went into the land and so on. But even in that, even in that, it's not about that little piece of land there. 
in the middle of the world. It's not about that. Look. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they come out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. A heavenly. Beloved, the eternal inheritance brings us there. It brings us all there. It doesn't say to the Jew that your inheritance is satisfied in a piece of land in a part of the world. It doesn't bring them there. It brought Abraham and all of his posterity and everyone to look to something more in Jesus Christ. Forever being with him in that land that is fairer than day. Where we see something that we can't even begin to fully comprehend. And we all join together. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and All the Gentiles gathered in, in their union in Jesus Christ. All of us. Now this is what the author of the Hebrews is is telling us over and over again. That the goal is this eternal inheritance. And it's leading us all the same way. And he's encouraging the Hebrews, don't find your satisfaction in Jerusalem. Don't find it in some building there with priests and sacrifices and all of the things that go along with that. Don't look there. Look onto Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ will bring you to an eternal inheritance. Jesus Christ will bring you to a land that can never be taken from you. Jesus Christ will bring you to a land where there's no war. And there's perfect peace forevermore. And the Prince of Peace reigns over his people forever. Where there's no more sorrow or pain or crying or death and so on and so forth. It's all gone away. It's all former. I wish we would see this. See Christ in all that he has fulfilled for us, Jew and Gentile. He is pointing to these Jews, you're to receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Stop thinking about the temporal. It's about what's coming in the future. And it's only for, who's it for? They which are called. They which are called. Who's that? Is it because you're born of the seed of Abraham? Jesus made that plain. No. He looked at Jews who were of the seed of Abraham and delighted and prided themselves in that. And he said, you're of your father, the devil. His forerunner, John the Baptist, looked at others like unto them and said that they were, they were vipers. A generation of vipers. It's for the called. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Have you been called? Have you? You say, how do I know? How do I know if I've been called? I've sat with people and they've, this is what they've struggled with. How do I know I'm called? How do I know I'm one of them? The answer is so simple. It is so simple. You know you've been called if you've responded to the call. It's as simple as that. You say, well, how do I know I've heard the call? You're hearing it now. The gospel is to be preached to every creature. And the command is to every creature, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, doesn't matter where you're from, what age you are, what your background, how good or so, whatever life you've lived. The call goes to all. The invite goes to all. And you know you're called when you have responded by agreeing with God concerning your sin, that you're worthy of hell, And coming to Jesus Christ with an open hand, receiving him and him alone as the way of your salvation. Christ alone. What you're promised, beloved, here, this eternal inheritance, if you've come, is think of all that you have now in Jesus Christ. Think of your justification. Think of your sanctification. 
Think of all the blessings that are yours in Christ. What you have now is is a juvenile version of what awaits you. It's like the early beginnings. It's the little sapling of all that's laid up. What awaits is grace brought to maturity. It's an experience of what you have now. Brought to a degree that will cause you to sing for all eternity. I'm never weary of it. In eternity you will find new things to be amazed at all the time. And you'll be perfectly satisfied. In a way we can't again begin to understand. I'll have to come back. But verses 15 and 16, let me just paraphrase, or 16 and 17, pardon me, verse 16 and 17. I've, the heading I put on this is the mediator must bear the responsibilities of the covenant. He must bear the responsibilities of the covenant. So you see the language that is before you. Let me give you Young's literal translation. It's as wooden as can be, but I think it gets to the heart of what these verses are actually saying. Listen carefully. And you can read verses 16 and 17 as I read this. For where a covenant is, the death of the covenant victim to come in is necessary. For a covenant over dead victims is steadfast, since it is no force at all when the covenant victim liveth. So that may sound a little weird to you, and you can go and read it for yourself. Let me help you understand what's in view. If, according to the context... It's pointing us to the covenant of Sinai made with the children of Israel. It is helping us to see what happened there on that occasion in which you have the death of the covenant victim that's necessary. For that covenant, it required the death of victims, the animals that Moses put to death and the blood which he used to sanctify. And when that happens, it makes it steadfast. It's not steadfast if the covenant victim continues to live. Doesn't they? So those animals came to typify something. The point of the author is to show that this covenant, this new covenant has been ratified by the shedding of Christ's blood. What you see there in Exodus 24, and we'll get to it next week, God willing, what you see there in the animals used, the blood shed, the ratifying of that covenant pointed to how the new covenant is ratified. It's ratified through the shedding of Christ's blood. That's what it's telling us. So I know there are other questions that may arise and you're free to disagree because the vast majority of men do. But my purpose is to stand before you having done due diligence in my study and present to you honestly what I think the text is saying. And I think it's much more simple than many make it out to be dealing with. It's not dealing with ratifying a, or dealing with a, new, a will and testament and so on and so forth that comes into action with the death of someone. It's dealing covenantally. What happened at Sinai and what we see in fulfillment with the death of Christ ratifying the new covenant bringing it into pass so that the old now goes away. What's the point? Christ is the only one that can deal with sin. That's, that's, what, it, that's what it comes down to. And you, what your takeaway is is simply this. Am I willing to bear the responsibility of my sin on myself? Am I? Am I willing to, to bear all of that? All my lust, all my blasphemy, all my idolatry, all my thieving, and all the expressions of it that aren't always just in terms of I took a property from someone, stealing time from your employer, looking with lust as Jesus deals with in Matthew 5. All of the kind of nuances and the, the shadowy areas that show us that our sin goes far deeper than we realize. Are you willing to bear that? 
Are you willing to stand before God and realize you sin far more than you could ever calculate? Are you willing? Because if you don't have Christ, that's what you're saying. You're walking out that door saying, I'll bear the responsibility myself. And what the offer is, what the offer from God is, you don't have to do that. I sent my son. And if you believe on him, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He will give of the water of life freely, which will quench and deal with all that you long for. And will satisfy not only you, but even more importantly, God. And you'll stand with your life, head with Christ in God, knowing that all your sins have been dealt with in full on the cross. The blood, shedding of Christ's blood cleanses it all away. And you stand in a covenant that promises that you are known by God. And you can know God yourself. There's no higher blessing. Make sure you're in Christ this morning. Let's bow together in prayer. If you're not saved, if you're not in Christ, again, I say to you, if you ask the question, how can I know I'm called? Have you responded to the free offer of the gospel? Have you sought Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? If not, then that on your head be it, so to speak. All your sins are on you. But we urge you, we appeal to you. The love of Christ moves us to yearn that you might seek the Lord this very day. Lord, bless your word. Thank you for giving it to us. And even those areas that can sometimes be more murky in our comprehension. We thank you that the plain things are plain. And that right through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you have revealed your desire to save. May all here today be saved, safely found in Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers. Hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. and Take us from this place rejoicing that you have called us and we have responded and we have enjoyed and tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Blessed is that man that trusteth in him. Go on then with us from this place and may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with all thy blood-bought people now and evermore. Amen.